Again, hello and welcome to the Adobe Students channel. My name is Terry White. It'll be my pleasure to be streaming live to you today on five ways, probably more than five, five ways to improve your travel photography or just photography in general. But since I just got back from a trip, I'm making it travel. Um, cool. Yep. <laughs> Uh, definitely there will be some Iceland involved and yes Michael hello how are you and Abdul how are you all right so with that said uh, looks like we have enough people in here to get going and the rest can you know fall in when they get here uh, so with that said let me go ahead and switch over to my computer and now that I'm on my computer I'm gonna be talking about post-processing tips obviously because that's what I do I talk about Photoshop and Lightroom and and various other Adobe products, but I'm also going to talk about just some photography tips in general to um, help you think about your next trip and what you might capture and ways you might capture it. So this is kind of going to, going to, going to kind of be in both areas, photography in general and post-processing after the fact. Um, hello, Nicole, and hello, Sh Shabib. I cannot see it from here, but I think I said that right. If I didn't, I apologize. All right, so uh, I got my, I got uh, just a few of my selections here that I'm going to use as examples uh, for the topics I'm going to talk about. Of course, uh, I have uh, a couple thousand images from my last trip that I'm still going through and processing and doing all that with. But these are some examples that I that I will use to help illustrate my point. And the first three all illustrate the same point. So let me show you what they are. And I'll tell you what the point is after I show them to you. So here's this one, and the next one, and the next one. And the point of these three photos, this is more of a photography tip, not so much a post-processing tip, is capture local people wherever you can, wherever you go, whenever you can, I should say. So it, it kind of adds a little flavor to your story. Now, these folks are probably visitors, but... Uh, you, we don't know. So it creates that mystery of, well, who are they? Are, are they visitors? Are they locals? Are they just hiking? Whatever it is, it, it just adds that little bit of element or a little bit of um, a mystique or element to your photos that otherwise you wouldn't get. Because what we're really used to seeing all the time, is we're used to seeing empty landscapes because as photographers, Sometimes we, we can't wait for people to get out of the shot so we can take it. And that's true. You know, of course, I would in this particular picture, I wouldn't want a bunch of people standing on the pier unless they were the subject. Uh, but in this case, I, I would want to wait for everyone to get out of the way and take the picture. But that doesn't mean I shouldn't have pictures of people. So people like to see people whenever you, you know, can show them people. So... If you can show the locals of wherever it is you're going, that will help tell your story just a little bit better. Um, so this woman lived on the island of Flatty, which has about, I don't know, a dozen inhabitants at any given time. Very, very small island. She lives in this little greenhouse here. Actually, it's a pretty big house. Um, and I don't know anything else about her other than she was standing out. I think she was waiting for the kids to come home from school or wherever they were coming home from. Maybe not school, summertime. But uh, she was just standing out there and I was I was across the road and I snapped a photo. Um, this guy came up and started talking to us. I was flying my drone, so he was talking to uh, Aner about just photography and drones in general, but he looks very local, so <laughs> I captured a shot of him as well. So in all, in all cases, wherever you can, capture a picture of people. Second thing, this leads me up to the next one. This is a picture of people, but it's more of a picture of the establishment that I was in. So in Iceland, there's really not a ton of fast food restaurants. Like you don't stop at a McDonald's or a Burger King or a Pizza Hut or anything like that to eat. The fast, the, the restaurants, or I should say the fast food places are built in to like the gas station. So it's like an all in one stop. You stop for gas. And you go in and you there's a you know a restaurant where they're cooking food, you know, food to order, and there's a place to sit or you take it with you and you keep going. 
So just being able, again, to have something to back up that story of not only telling that this is what it is, and also the expression on her face is priceless. I can't read the rest of her t-shirt, but it's priceless. But anyway, um, also just reminding myself what the food costs. So for example, uh, this, this uh, let's see, this number three here, um, 950, um, uh, Kronos, that's about nine dollars and fifty cents. So the twenty-one fifty, that's twenty-one dollars and fifty cents. So the food over there, again, is expensive by our standards of what food like this would cost. We would expect to pay, you know, four or five bucks for a bur you know, no, for a meal like that. Uh, so almost you can think of it as double or triple the price in a lot of cases of what we're used to here in the U.S. So just think about those kinds of things when you're traveling. Capture. And of course, um, whenever you can to help tell your story, you're going to be included. So uh, people don't have a problem doing selfies, but also include the people you're with, um, you know, in, in, in more interesting places. Like that way, you can help tell the story. We were up on top of this this massive hill with all kinds of waterfalls and bays underneath, and caves and everything underneath us. So just. Keep that in mind. People help tell your story. So that's tip number one. Tip number two, when you're in a challenging lighting scenario. So what I mean by that is you've got, in this case, if I expose for the, the pier, the water, the boat, everything looks good, but the sky looks kind of blown out and the mountaintops look really blown out. If I expose for the mountain in the sky, then uh, the stuff down below gets too dark. So what we tend to do or what we would look for, to do as photographers is one of two things. Um, you would need to either have a camera that can shoot in what's called HDR or high dynamic range. Like for example, there's a mode in the Lightroom app on iOS devices that support RAW. They can also shoot. In H Actually, I don't think you need RAW for HDR. You can shoot in HDR right on the phone. And it will take three shots, one underexposed, one overexposed, and one kind of in the middle, and combine them together all in the app itself. Now, I so saw Michael asked a question, I think it was about model releases. Uh, well, Michael, if I were going to sell those images, I would need model releases, but I can take pictures of people in public all day long. It happens all the time. So, as long as I'm not selling those images with their faces showing, uh, I don't need a model release for that. I don't need a model release to use them non-commercially, I should say. All right. So anyway, back to our, um, hang on, let's see. Uh, is there a litter problem polluting the landscape? Is there a litter problem polluting the landscape? Uh, no, actually, Iceland is very clean. There might have been something in that particular shot, but very, very clean place. Um, and I'll talk about fixing that one shot in just a minute. So anyway, back to the HDR thing. When you're in a challenging lighting situation, if you're not going out at the best times of day, which are morning or evening, if you're out at the worst times of day, which are middle of the day, uh, then, you, then you want to either shoot in HDR, if your camera supports it, or you want to shoot multiple exposures, which is called bracketing, which you can either do manually if your camera doesn't have a bracket feature, or just turn it on bracketing. So I set my, my DSLR to shoot bracketing for three exposures. Give me that one that's overexposed, give me that one that's underexposed, give me that one that's in the middle. And what I can then do in Lightroom is I could take all three of those shots and combine them together. But I'm going to even show it to you, let's say your camera doesn't do that. Let's say your camera doesn't have bracketing and you, you don't know how to do it even if your camera does. I'm going to give you the easiest way to do this. Because you can do it with two shots. You don't have to do it with three. You know that you can point your camera and focus on something and that will adjust the light. Even if it's an iPhone or a smartphone, you can tap to where it will focus and that will adjust the exposure. So if you can't do bracketing and do three shots, just do two. Point at something that's in the dark areas so that it exposes for the darkness like this shot. Take it. Hopefully you're in a tripod or it could be very steady. Then tap on the something that should be light and expose for it. 
and that will give you the two exposures you need. Oh, it went the wrong way. Oh, wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. Hang on, I'm lost. All right, there we go. So we're gonna do the that exposure and then that exposure. It's gonna go between those two. Now, once you take those two, you can then come to a program like Lightroom or Camera Raw in Photoshop, and you can Control H on the keyboard, or you can right click. You can go to Photo Merge and you can create an HDR. So Control H on the keyboard or Photo Merge HDR, all you need is two or more exposures. If you got three, if you got four, great. You can create a greater dynamic range. But if you only have two, you can still get it done. So if I take these two, it will now combine them and give me a quick preview of what those two would look like put together. And I'll let it do that. It will also, if you weren't on a tripod, it will auto align them. So it'll kind of do its best to line them up because you're not on a tripod. They're, you're going to have some movement in the camera. And then it will give you that exposure of both the sky and the water, the below. So the top and below, I get a nice even exposure between the two. Uh, it'll also show me if something moved with the red overlay. So whatever that is in that upper left corner is something that was moving. It might have been a bird flying by, whatever it was. I can see there was movement in that spot, meaning it wasn't in both frames. All right, so once I go merge, what Lightroom will do or Camera Raw will do is it will create a brand new exposure, brand new raw file of the two combined. So you'll still have your two originals, your three originals, uh, but you'll have a brand new uh, DNG file, which is a raw file, that you can then do whatever you want to do with it. So it's, you still have the originals of the different exposures, and then you'll have the new one that's put together. And by the way, that's a background process, so you can go do other things while you're waiting for that. All right, so here's the new HDR. It usually puts it right in the middle of the ones you did or next to them. And so now I can go into the develop module with that new HDR because there's some things we still need to fix. So let's give it a second to pop over to develop. And once we're in develop, uh, one of the main things that needs to be fixed in this particular photo, one of the, one of the I, would, I would call this tip number three, if you're going to shoot any type of landscape, anything outside, anything with a horizon line, what is the most distracting of any horizon line shot is if the horizon line is crooked. In other words, the world is leaning. In this case, the world is leaning to the right, and it shouldn't be. So to fix that, you can do it a couple of ways. You can either hope you, there's an auto way to do it. If it doesn't do it in auto, you can do it manually. So I always try auto first. That is to click the auto straighten. So there's the angle tool. That's the manual way to do it. But if I click auto just to see what happens, and there it is, it's straight. So now, when it straightens, it will need to crop it a bit. If I don't like the way it straightens, maybe it was lining it up on something else and I think the horizon's still crooked, or it didn't align it at all and I need to do it manually, I can grab the angle tool, just click on it, and then I can drag out a line of what I think should be straight, and then just adjust it a little bit more. So it will, unfortunately, crop into the photo because it has no choice because it's got to angle it and you can't leave white space, but at least I get that perfectly straight horizon line now. All right, the next thing. Um, this is one of the, this is a bonus tip. Uh, this is something you should probably apply to all your photos, is that no matter what camera you're using, Harold Davis, what's going on, man? Uh, no matter what camera you're using, there's some lens distortion because lenses are not flat, they're rounded. So there will be some lens distortion no matter what. On landscapes, probably not a big deal. On people, it's a bigger deal. But you can enable profile lens correction in the lens correction area of both Lightroom and Camera Raw. And look at what it just did there. See how it took the curvature and straightened it out, kind of flattened out the image? Um, so that's like step number one of all the things I do. Uh, or every photo I bring up, I always enable the lens correction. Now, if you had some challenging, you're shooting into the sun or shooting with sun or bright lights in front of you, you might also want to remove chromatic aberration. That's where the lens couldn't focus on all the various light sources coming in. 
and it will usually leave halos around your images. Um, but I don't need it in this case. All right, next up. Um, the image is still a, a bit washed out for me. Uh, even though it did, gave me a nice HDR exposure, uh, it's still just a little hazy. So that brings me to our next tip, which will be in the effects panel, dehaze. Now the thing about dehaze is dehaze does this wonderful thing where you can bring back all that rich color, but you can, just like anything else, you can overdo it. So I, I like to uh, just remind people that too much dehaze or anything else is usually a bad thing. That's too much, so let's back off. Let's come back to zero. And you see, see what a big difference that is? Right around zero. So you can type in your increment. So I can type in like a 10. Let me see what 10 would do. Let me see what 20 would do. And I usually don't like to go above 20 or 25. Because when you go too high, not only does it start to look bad, but even if it's starting to look still okay, going too high will tend to introduce artifacts like grain and noise and things in your photo. So after you do your dehaze, you want to click on, uh, you want to click and zoom in to check and see what the um, check and see what the pixels look like after you've done it. If you see a bunch of extra noise, then go back and remove some of the dehaze. All right, the other thing that we can do on this photo, now that we got our dehaze in there, we can always, always bump up the vibrance a little bit. We can always bump up the clarity just a little bit, make it just a little bit more punchy. Uh, where I see the little thing like floating here in the water, that's a little bit of a distraction for me. So I can always use the spot removal tool to clean up that one little spot down there. Just click and that will go find another area that doesn't have a spot and fill it in with it. So now if I get rid of the spot removal tool, it's gone. And all of these are non-destructive. So if I do something and don't like it, I could always come back and, for example, put that spot back. Oh no, someone said that was important and it used to be there, uh, which it doesn't. Now the other thing is if I wanted to make the sky just a little bit more dramatic than what it is because it was kind of like sunset and the sun hadn't gone down yet and the sky is still kind of light, that nice golden hour, um, I could always go in and use the graduated filter and I'll set my graduated filter to, let's set it to temp, let's try that first, and let's just make the, the sky a little bluer, a little darker. So I can just go ahead and pull this down just a bit. And now I can play around with what I've got. I can make the temperature a little more blue, or I can make a little the sky a little bit more dehazed and just get that, that little bit more, actually I like dehaze better. Um, so we'll, leave, we'll back off the temperature a bit and we'll just give it a little bit more dehaze. Or saturation or whatever it is you want to add to that. You can also add sharpness. Um, and, and that will just bring that image out just uh, that much more. Okay, so when I'm done, which I'm done, uh, I can go back and I can look at the before and after a couple of ways. Uh, here, let's see if I do it this way. Let's go to that, actually. That, that. That's before, that's after. So I'm hitting the, I'm in develop, I'm hitting the backslash key. Before, look at how far we came, just in just a few, a few clicks, and after. Hello Dana, how are you? All right, so now we got that done. Uh, let's see, so we talked about challenging exposures, creating those HDRs. Uh, whether you do it in the camera, whether you do it in post-production, doesn't matter, just try and capture that exposure where you're getting the highlights, the shadows, um, you know, in a nice even exposure or a nice good or good exposure across the board. Okay, next up, let's uh, talk about when it doesn't all fit in one frame. So for example, when I look at this particular landscape, this starts from the ocean and these waves of water going all the way across the uh, field here. Now I did bring a wide angle lens and I could have switched to the wide angle lens and, sh and shot this, but this was kind of a, we pulled over on the road, quick, get out and shoot it, 
get back in the car and keep going. So I didn't really have time to shoot a lot of, a lot of or switch lenses and do all that. Um, and I didn't bring a second body with a second lens. So, and maybe you don't even have a second body, or maybe you're just shooting it with your cell phone, smartphone. So what you can do is click, click, click. Take three, four, five exposures, frames, where you've got a little bit of overlap, maybe 20% overlap between the shots, because then you'll end up with that and that. So you'll be able to get it all one way or the other. Oh, wait, I don't know if I got all of it. Hold on. I think I got the wrong three frames here. Or that's the beginning. That's the middle, and that's the end. Okay, so let's look at it again. That's the beginning, that's the middle, and that's the end. Okay, got it now. So I, I have these three shots, and I could have gone and make it a, take it a fourth or fifth one and kept going, but you get the idea. Now, I can take those three that overlap, right click, do a photo merge, photo merge, panorama. You have panorama and HDR built into Lightroom and built into Camera Raw and Photoshop. Usually when you do a panorama, especially if you're going to hand hold it like I did, you will end up with some blank space. So with Lightroom, you could crop it and end up with a nice even, even shot, or you can use the new boundary warp, which will kind of warp the image into that empty space. I love that. All right, then we'll click Merge, and that will put them together. All right, so it's building that panorama again in the background. I don't have to wait on that. While, we're, while that's building, let me show you a couple other things. Don't forget to shoot the food. People are always interested when you come back from a trip. How is the food? What did the food look like? What do they have? What do they eat in Iceland? So forth and so on. So don't forget to shoot the food. Uh, this particular shot was a, uh, obviously a dessert. And I actually submitted this one to Adobe Stock, and it got approved, uh, I think, today or yesterday. Um, but that was just, that was dinner at the Hotel Flatty on the island, a little island of 12 or 13 residents. And that was what we had for dinner that day, or what I had. All right, so don't forget to shoot the food. And, of course, here's your panorama. And now that we got that nice wide panorama, I think I've used this image as my... Um, my um, banner pick on Facebook already, but again, we can do the same things. We can apply a little lens correction to it. And of course, we could go in and um, make some adjustments. The blacks, the whites, the vibrance, saturation, and add a little bit of dehaze to it, not too much. Maybe 15 in this case. There we go. It makes, it makes it nice and blue. And the horizon looks pretty good across here. If I need to straighten it, I would. But you get the idea. So there's our panorama. So number one tip, shoot people. Number two, uh, if you have a diff difficult exposure, shoot it bracketed. Shoot for HDR. Number three, shoot panos. Number four, shoot the food. Tip number five, shoot interesting angles we tend to walk up to a scene and go click and you end up all your photography ends up looking five feet from the ground or six feet from the ground however tall you are because you're always going in with your camera and shooting at the at eye, eye level well sometimes you might want to bend down you might want to stand on top of something and shoot down whatever the whatever the uh, situation may be in this case um, went out to the boat, out, uh, the deck of the boat, and I leaned over and, and very carefully and held my phone very tightly and grabbed this shot. Uh, again, an angle that you know we typically don't see from a boat. We usually see the boat from the front, the back, the side, whatever. But just that, hey, we're headed this way, kind of angle. And I like having a nice hook in there as well. Um, in this case, uh, just I positioned the camera down a bit to kind of shoot out of these all these stone sculptures that people were uh, making and leaving behind. And of course, sometimes you just got to get on the ground. Uh, when you get on the ground and shoot up, you get a totally different perspective, and this will also help tell your story or just help make your photography a bit more interesting. 
Now, in a case like this, when you're shooting down really low, um, I couldn't really get the shot I wanted because the ground was wet, and I honestly just didn't want to lay on the wet ground. Um, so I put my camera down, and I set it on a platypod, which is a flat type mount for your um, camera. And, or your DSLR, um, and when I got it down there, uh, I just hoped for the best. I like I kind of moved it around and focused on different things after just hearing the beat. But I was reminded after I did all this, after we were driving off, if your camera has a tilt LCD, great, you can do that. But if your camera doesn't have a tilt LCD, and mine didn't, but you have an app, like many phones can that, or many, I'm sorry, many, many cameras, you can use your phone as the viewfinder if they support Bluetooth or NFC or whatever, so or Wi-Fi even. So um, again, my camera didn't support that, but there were cameras that I had that were around me that did. So I could have put the camera down, connected via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to the, to the phone using the app, looked at the viewfinder, tapped the focus the whole nine yards, and taken all the pictures I want without me physically having to lay on the wet ground. Uh, I'm not opposed to laying on the ground, but I mean, I am opposed to laying in water and puddles and mud and marshes and things like that, especially if I'm not suited for it. All right, so with that said, those are our five plus tips for your uh, travel or photography in general. Uh, more to come, and hopefully you got something out of this that will make it worth your viewing that you viewed today, that you joined in and watched. All right, let me make sure I didn't miss any burning questions here before we sign off lots of hellos hello phoenix and i think i got all the questions all right got a beach vacation next month you need some tips hopefully you got some uh beach beach vacations make sure you take because you're probably gonna be shooting around around a lot of water Make sure you take a polarizing filter for your camera. Those are like sunglasses, literally, for your camera. And uh, depending on how, what time of day you're going to be shooting, you might want to shoot, bring some ND filters, some uh, neutral density filters as well, to kind of so you can get those long exposures of the water by dimming your lens. Uh, so those are a couple tips for your next month's beach shoot. I have a next month beach shoot as well, so I'm kind of reminding myself of the things I'm going to need. All right, with that said, thanks everyone for watching. Take care, and we will catch you on the next one. Cheers, everybody. Uh, sign off now. Later.